Let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we continue in our studies on the 2520, we want to once again ask for a blessing, for grace and strength. Help us to be able to discern your will for your people in these last days. Father, as we see prophecy fulfilling before our eyes, so many of us are unprepared for the events which are soon to break upon this world. For the vast majority of this Earth's population, Lord, it will be an overwhelming surprise, but it should not be for your people. And yet many of us, Father, are still asleep, waiting and wondering what the, the next turn of events will be. And yet the very events, Father, which precede the close of probation have been clearly laid out in your word. And yet multitudes, Father, multitudes of your people are unfamiliar with those truths and don't understand. Please help us, Father, individually to be diligent students of your word. Help us to stop making excuses, Father, for our age, our ignorance, whatever frailty, Lord, we might hold on to. When our names are called up in the judgment, all these excuses will be swept away. Help each of us, Father, to send our sins beforehand unto judgment so that individually, Lord, we might have a relationship with you, Father, that will stand in the day of judgment. Please guide our thoughts and our feelings as we continue in our studies. We ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So continuing our study on the 2520, as you will recall, we've looked at four segments or four issues around the 2520. We're on our final segment now, part four, which really deals with the nuts and bolts of what the 2520 is about. We are no longer proving or attempting to prove what the 2520 is in the sense that it's a time prophecy. Um, the studies will progress with the assumption that it is, a it is a time prophecy and we'll proceed on that with that understanding. As you remember in our last study we began to look at the 2520 going to the Gospels. So we were looking at Matthew Mark and Luke, specifically chapters 24, 13 and 21. And as you recall in our previous study, these chapters really deal with a, a dialogue between the disciples and Jesus. The thing that sparks off this conversation between them is a dialogue that Christ has with the priests. He explains to them how their house is going to be left unto them desolate, how the temple is going to be destroyed, and because of this dialogue, the disciples become concerned, and then they ask a question to Christ. If you remember that we spoke about the fact that the disciples, because of their education, the training, the upbringing that they had received, could not imagine that Jerusalem would be destroyed independent of the end of the world. So when they came to ask the question of Christ to, for him to explain to them, they asked their question in this fashion. They asked a single question, but they broke it down into four segments. And I'll just go through those four questions again. They asked four things. They said, when shall these things be? When shall the temple be destroyed? What shall be the sign when these things are about to happen? What shall be the sign that you're about to come back? And what shall be the sign that the world is about to end? So they look for four things. First of all, they, look for, they ask, when is the temple going to be destroyed? Then they ask, 
what is the sign, well, what signs are there going to be so that we can know that the temple is going to be destroyed beforehand? Then they ask, what signs are there going to be before the return of Christ? And then the final question they ask is, what are the signs going to be that the world is about to come to an end? As you recall, Jesus addresses all four of their questions, but he, he addresses it in a way where he leaves the disciples and us to work out which bits are which of his answer. So he doesn't. He gives all the. He gives. He gives them all the answers that they uh, to their questions, but he does it in a way where they still have to do some work. They have to do some investigation. They have to figure out the ins and outs of his response. I begin to introduce to you this concept that when he gave his response, he did it in a way to meet their needs, to meet their understanding, and also ours. So as they believed that Jerusalem and the destruction of the world would happen at the same time, he responded to their question in that fashion. So he mingled all of these events together. He did it to suit them, but he also does it for a very important reason for our benefit. And that is this, that... There's a history that occurs from AD 31 to AD 70, which is the destruction of Jerusalem. And what Christ does in a very clever way, he introduces this destruction of Jerusalem as a type of the end of the world or a prefigure of the end of the world. And by doing that, he not only meets the demands of the disciples, he also did meets the demands of God's people today. What do I mean by that? By looking through the events that occur during the destruction of Jerusalem, and we looked at five points, if you recall, we're able to go in and see those events that literally occurred at that time to help us to be able to discern the times in which we're living so that we might be able to know the signs that should come just before the return of Christ, just before the destruction of the world. So if this is the destruction of Jerusalem and this is the end of the world, where we live, and we live in 2009. What we're required to do is to get these two histories and overlap them. Now we know from both the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy that we have information about what's going to occur at the end of the world. But it's not complete. We have way marks, but the information that's given isn't complete. So by going back into these histories in the Bible, for instance, the destruction of Jerusalem, we can begin to add detail to our understanding of what's going to occur at the end of the world. As an example, the majority of Seventh-day Adventists have read the Great Controversy, and we know that we, can ha we have some key dates, some key events, very basic. We have 1844, when the sanctuary began to be cleansed. Between 1844 and where we're living now in 2009, there isn't much information. We could put some dates, we could put 1888, for instance. There are some people in Adventism who understand the history of 1888 fairly well, and some people don't. But there, aren't, there isn't that much information. All we know for sure 
is that sometime, and we will say in the near future, there's going to be a Sunday law. We're given that information in Revelation 13. We know this, inf we know this Sunday law is going to start in the United States. And it's going to progress to all the countries of the world. Great Controversy teaches that. And that sometime after the, when this Sunday law has uh, begun to take effect, there's going to be a death decree. And then sometime after that, there's going to be the close of probation. And then we're going to have the second advent. But before we get to this key event here, the Sunday Law, we don't have that much information. So by going back into these histories, we can begin to piece together much more information than we have with a surface reading of the Great Controversy or Revelation 13, for example. So that's why it's important and it's, um, let me put it that way, we're required to know these histories in some depth so that we can be prepared for the events that are soon to occur. The majority of people in Adventism believe, there's hardly anybody, if you were to ask, who would say that this is going to be long. This is going to be a very short time. If you read the newspapers, if you watch the news on the TV, you'll know that events are transpiring in the world that will clearly show us that we don't have much time left. The economy is collapsing, the papacy is on the rise, um, conservative Protestantism is on the rise in the United States, as well as liberalism. So there are all these contending forces that are occurring. And unless we understand these events that are going to occur, we most assuredly will not be prepared for these events. Not only that, without looking back in history and, and piecing the things together to know what's going to happen from 2009 and onwards, and even filling in some of these blanks to see what's happened in recent history, without doing that, our expectations of what's about to occur will be warped and distorted. Now we know when you go back into the history of Israel during the time of Christ, so if we go to around 4 BC when Christ was born, and we look at the history here, we know that one of the things that Israel struggled with, for various reasons, primarily national pride. Is that from the leadership down, they educated the people to expect Christ, or the Messiah as they would say, his coming to be as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. They're expecting him to come and destroy their enemies. They were in captivity to the Romans. So when Christ, the Messiah, as they expected him to come, because of their national pride, because of their arrogance, because of their, their agenda, they were expecting Christ to come and destroy their enemies and that they would become the nation that would rule the world and he would put down their enemies. So when he came in a fashion that they weren't expecting, that's one of the primary reasons why they rejected him. If he had come in a fashion that they were looking for as a, as a Messiah that, that they really desired, they would have accepted him, but they weren't. In the same way, when we come to the end of the world, I'm not suggesting that we have spiritual pride in the church, but what I am suggesting is that if we don't understand the sequence and events of prophecy clearly, we will fall into the trap of expecting things to be in a, in a certain way and when they don't turn out that way we'll get caught short and, and miss events and um, 
missed events that we require to know. One of, the, one, of the, one of the greatest dangers that I feel that we're in as a church is not only that we'll miss events, uh, not even realise that they're going to occur, but we're expecting events to occur which have already occurred. So, as an example, we won't be touching it in this, in this study, but we're expecting events to occur after the Sunday law. And these, the, our expectation of these events are not based upon a close and detailed study of the word. They're based upon a culture in Adventism that's filtered down through a surface reading of God's word. And we've just accepted those ideas and concepts in an in identical way that the Jews did. That's one of the reasons why the disciples struggled so much with the teachings that Christ was trying to give to them. You'll recall, if you've read the Gospels, I'm sure you have, um, when Christ would tell them something and they didn't know what he was talking about. When he would talk about the resurrection from the dead, they didn't understand what that concept meant. They couldn't understand what the Lamb of God was. There were so many issues because of their education that they were confused about. And we have fallen, we have fallen into the same trap today because of surface reading by our elders, our forefathers, which have been filtered down through custom and tradition to us. We hold on to a number of concepts which are not sound and which are not found in the Word of God. One of those ones we dealt with in our last presentation. So after the destruction of Jerusalem, the second phase of history that Christ talks about in this discourse is the Dark Ages. From AD 538 to AD 1798. Now when we're in, in Adventism, look at this history, we just see it as a historical phenomena of what the papacy did hundreds of years ago and it has no relevance, no bearing upon our present lives and our future lives. But if we can begin to see what Christ is trying to do here in this discourse, he's trying to pre-warn um, his, his children of what's, what's going to happen at the end of the world. So we looked at the destruction of Jerusalem and the history that's spoken about here primarily is one of persecution but it's worse than persecution because persecution is, is, is brought to view here. This persecution deals with torture and death. And this is not just torture and death of men. This is babes, children, women who are pregnant. If you go back and read some of the history books of that time period, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs, uh, History of the Reformation, you'll see the carnage that the papacy inflicted upon God's people during that time period. Christ is clearly trying to teach his people that this is a type of an event that's going to occur at the end of the world. And if you remember in our last study, we went into the book of Revelation and showed how we can find that. When you go to Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 20, you can piece together this very um, warning that Christ is trying to give to us. So one of, the issues, one of the things that we speak about in the church today is that all of us are joyfully expecting in 2009 the close coming of Christ at his second advent and we skip all of this history that's going to occur here and we ignore it and we think it's just going to be a nice jovial time, we're going to go and do some evangelism and it's all going to be good and 
you know, the 50 members at our local church, if you ask them, are you already accepted Christ? And everybody puts their hand up um, and we're all waiting, ready for his close return. And we ignore all of this, these events are going to go on. People ask things like, get ready because Christ has come any day. He could come tomorrow. We don't know. You may have heard, a, you know, a question like that. People say, when could Christ come? He could come tomorrow. And he can't. Christ cannot come tomorrow because if you look at the sequence of events that are clearly laid down in the word of God, we know for a certainty that he can't because certain events have to occur and they take time to occur. Now, I'm not suggesting he couldn't come in 12 months, 18 months, but he certainly cannot come tomorrow while we're living as we are today. So our whole concept of prophecy has been distorted and warped. And one of the things is that we have blanked out of our minds this whole issue of torture, death and persecution. And I'm not saying we should dwell on this thing, but to pretend that it's not going to occur will leave us short. And what it will mean is that we have an incorrect understanding of the events that are about to occur after 2009 and onward. And what that will do is, when these events begin to come about and they impact our personal lives, we're opening ourselves to this issue that when they come, because we're not prepared, we're not prepared for them, when they do come, we'll walk away from that conflict and persecution. How do we know we'll do that? Because when you come into the history of uh, Israel at the time of Christ, in AD 31 when Christ was crucified, you remember the night before his crucifixion in the Garden of Gethsemane, where Christ was, had repeatedly told his disciples for the last three years to prepare for that event, he warned them time and again, and they didn't heed his warning, that when the event came to them, when the crisis came, because they were unprepared, it, things were turning out in a way that they weren't expecting, they ran and fled. And not one of them, not one of them stood. Fortunately, for the disciples, God rounded them up. And as the scripture says, he only lost one, and that one wasn't even his. He said he was of a devil. In our day, it won't be that way. When we fall and crumble, when the Sunday law hits our lives individually, we won't have a second chance. Because we are required to know the events of history before they occur. And we've been given a, a, an abundance amount, a, amount of information. The history of the destruction of Jerusalem, the history of the Dark Ages, and there's a third history we're going to be dealing with in, in a moment. Um, all of those histories pre-warn us of the events that are about to occur. So we're required to learn the lessons. These things were written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world will come. They were in samples to us. So that's just a recap of where we got to in our last study. And now I want to deal with a third segment, the final segment of this prophecy. Remember, we're not going into all the details of this. What we're just doing, I'm just giving you an overview of these chapters because we want to pick out certain points once, we've, when, once you've got an overview of the structure um, and continue in our study on the 2520. So the third segment It deals with a history from 1798 to 1844. In this history, if we go through the verses in these chapters in, in the way that I suggested to you in our previous study is to line up these verses in a systematic fashion and while you do that, 
line up the verses, the phrases, the, chap the paragraphs that are in Desire of Ages, chapter 69. And there are a number of waymarks or um, histories or events that are given in this history. So I'm just going to pull that down and just write some of those, some of those things that Christ brings up. He says that there are going to be false prophets. These false prophets, I'm just going to give you the chapter, the verses from Matthew. They're from verse 23 to 27. He then talks about the sun, moon and stars. He then talks about the distress of nations. He then speaks about the coming of Christ in the clouds. Now, as I said, we're not going through all these things in detail, but I just want to show you one thing. Often, when I've spoken to people, and, and most people have read th these chapters, particularly Matthew 24, and without having a, a clear understanding uh, of the structure of this prophecy, to see that it's talking about three separate histories, what people tend to do is just to see this as kind of like a, a, a single prophecy with individual events that are just laid out there, in a kind of a random fashion, haphazard even, and they pick out bits and pieces out of this prophecy and apply them to the end of the world. We spoke about the destruction of Jerusalem. I'm just going to pick up one point here in a moment. But for instance, when we come to this time period here, one of the key things that we speak about is the distress of nations. We talk about the distress of nations as an end time event, saying, you know, the whole world is being turned upside down by everything that's going on, uh, nature, wars, um, Islam, um, Soviet Union, all these countries, China, North Korea, Iran, and there's a distress of nation going on. So we, we, we pick out these things and bring them to the end of the world. If you remember from the destruction of Jerusalem, in Matthew 24, verse 11, Christ spoke about false prophets there. If you have a look at the, the language that's spoken about in verse 11 and verse 23 to 27, both talking about false prophets, the language is very similar. Most people don't see the inconsistency of having false prophets spoken about here at the beginning of the chapter and then false prophets spoken about here at the end of the chapter and trying to understand, well, how do you deal with these two things that are spoken about, speaking about false prophets if this is just kind of a single prophecy that's dealt with an end-of-the-world scenario? But if you begin to look at this prophecy in this, in this structured fashion, that it's not talking about primarily the end of the world, it's talking about literal historical events that occurred in the past, it becomes very clear. So you can have false prophets here, as a history, as a historical event, and you can have it here as well.
and now it doesn't now there's no inconsistency because they're talking about two separate histories here two separate events where you will have false prophets coming on the scene in this time frame and you'll have false prophets coming on the scene in this time frame and when you begin to overlap these histories you can begin to see what these false prophets are doing here what these false prophets are doing here combine them together and you'll begin to see what's going to happen at the end of the world without understanding this prophecy in this fashion you don't have the tools to be able to see why Christ is speaking about false prophets twice it doesn't make the sense that Christ wanted it to so before I move on this is what Christ is trying to do he's trying to tell his disciples there are going to be three historical events he only picks out these three in this prophecy and he says that all of these pre these three histories prefigure the end of the world they bring out different points that are going to occur at the end of the world and what he wants us to be able to do with this information is to line them up in a certain way so he wants us to get the destruction of Jerusalem look at these events that occur there pick out those events and begin to realize that those events are going to be repeated at the end of the world on top of that he wants us to look at the dark ages look at the events that occurred there and see how that's going to have an impact at the end of the world and then he wants us to go and look at the history of the Millerites and look at those events and see that those events too will occur at the end of the world and by doing this we can begin to not have four points or five points but we can have as a minimum just from this simple um, prophecy we can be, begin to look at you know ten points uh, that are brought up here now when I drew that little timeline um, of you know a basic overview of what's going to occur at the end of the world based upon you know Revelation 13 great controversy we didn't have many waymarks we didn't have many pointers we didn't have the detail that we really need to but by going through this kind of study we can begin to get many more points some of them are very subtle some of them are not so subtle but it begins to fill in the details that we are required to know now there are some people who are listening to this presentation who will think that they don't need to know all this because they've read the great controversy they know there's going to be a Sunday law and that God's going to take care of his people and everything's going to be okay it's a very dangerous mindset to have let me give a practical example everybody's been to school we've all had examinations examination normally comes around June maybe May depending on where you are so when you're in January you know you've got six months you know you've got six months and there is nobody that I have ever met who starts revising in January and nobody revises in January when February March April when you get to April and you come to your Easter holidays then people begin to start panicking they start making a, a revision plan and start thinking well maybe we actually need to put, start putting some hours into this because examination day is coming so they might allocate half an hour an hour a day get sidetracked make commitments fall back on them but when you start getting to May and now you're back at school now you begin to start panicking because you know you can't avoid that date and it's coming close when your examination day is on the 16th of June 
And now it's the 15th and it's 7 p.m. There are very few people now who are not revising, who are not panicking, who are not sweating. The point I'm trying to make here is when you know that examination day is going to be here, and before I go on, we don't know when the Sunday law is going to occur. We know that it's now near at hand. But the way that we are required to know how near it is, is by looking at the histories here and the details and the points and filling in the blanks. That's how we know we're approaching closer. Because without this, without these tools, all we do, all we have are just these gross sway marks, January to June, and we don't know when it's going to be. If someone were to say to you in January, you're going to have an examination day, and I'm not going to tell you when it is, but it's going to be sometime this year. It could be next month, or it could be in December. What help would that give you? What, what assistance would that be to you? It'd drive you mad. God is not in the business of doing that to his people. This Sunday law is going to come as an overwhelming surprise to the world. It should not be to his people. God has given us sufficient information. Ellen White says, the events that occur before the close of probation are clearly laid out in his word. And they are, but we're required to dig and find them. They're not given to us on a plate. Ellen White has not written a manual on all the events that occur preceding the Sunday law and the second advent in a way that she hands it out on a plate. You have to work for it. Just in the same way we have to work for our examination. But we all know, June the 15th at 7pm, you're going to be behaving differently than you are on January the 1st. And that's why we are required to understand these events, understand these histories, pick out points from them, and begin to build up a much more detailed picture of the events that precede the Sunday Law, the Second Advent, the close of probation, so that we can make the necessary preparation. It's a delusion. It is a delusion to think that we will be okay knowing we're alive in 2009 and sometime next year, in 10 years time, in 20 years time, who knows when, <coughs> that the Sunday law is going to occur. God will not do that to his people. He is in the business of saving, not destroying men's lives. And he has given us sufficient information to warn us and prepare us. You ask any school teacher, they will know after years of experience that everybody in January is wasting their time and messing around, as are God's people. God knows that. He knows without help we will not be ready for, prepar for examination day. We will not be ready. So in his wisdom, he's given us the tools He's given us the information, the ability, the Holy Spirit has enlightened the minds of men so that we can go into his word and begin to lay out way marks from here to here so that we can make the necessary preparation. That's why this, this information is required. When you go through this history here, from 1798 to 1844, most people don't have an issue with this history. This history they can swallow. This one is problematic. And the reason why it's problematic is because if you read carefully the wording of these chapters, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, it looks like when you come to the end of this history, it looks like God is talking about the second advent and not 1844. You know, Christ is a good God. And his, he has a way of overriding Satan and his plans and the mistakes of God's people. 
And one of the things that Christ has the ability to do, because he's the Alpha and Omega, he sees the end from the beginning, he has the ability to make unfulfilled prophecy still work. Now, unfulfilled prof prophecy is something that um, are we okay to carry on? Or? Yeah. Unfulfilled prophecy is something that we struggle with. Conceptually, it's, it's hard for us to deal with. But it does happen. Um, and God has a way of still working around all these issues. So let me give you some examples of unfulfilled prophecy. First of all, let me say this, if you read Spirit of Prophecy, um, you will see, even with a superficial reading of, of her works, that she'll tell you that it was not God's will that we should be in the wilderness, you know, for around 160 years. It was never his will for us to be here. We, should, we, should, we have been born out of time. It was his will that Christ was going to return very soon after 1844. And if he had, the way that these chapters were written, this event here would have been his second advent. It would have been speaking about that. But because of the backsliding and negligence of God's people, that didn't happen. And here we are in 2009, and now all these events have become historical events. But these events aren't wasted. In God's foresight, what he has had the ability to do is take those histories here, which were really only to occur once, and he has the ability, he has the foresight, he has the wisdom, that these events here will reoccur at the end of the world. Just like the destruction of Jerusalem, the Dark Ages, the Millerite history, the events that were portrayed and that occurred here will reoccur at the end of the world. So let me just give you... Um, one example from the Word of God, and I'll just give you one or two spirit prophecy statements about unfulfilled prophecy. So if you go to Isaiah 65, and we'll pick up from verse 17. Now when... Most people, when they look at this portion of Isaiah, they think it's talking about an occurrence that's going to be in heaven. But if you read carefully, it really isn't. In its primary application, it's talking about an event that was supposed to occur on earth after the return of the Jews from Babylon. So from, we pick up from verse 17, it says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. And here in verse 20, we know it's not talking about heaven. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner, being a hundred years old, shall be accursed. Now we know when we go to heaven, there's not going to be any death, and there aren't going to be any sinners. So this passage here is talking about the restoration of Israel after the Babylonian captivity. That's the, that's the primary point of this prophecy. God said, if you are faithful 
this is what will happen. This is what Jerusalem will be like. We know Jerusalem was not faithful. Israel did not repent. They did not turn back to God. And this was an unfulfilled prophecy for them. It will be fulfilled after the second advent. And, there, and it, so it will be fulfilled in, in a spiritual sense in the new Jerusalem, in heaven. So it has a literal application which was not fulfilled and it also has a spiritual application at the end of the world which will be fulfilled. In the same way, this prophecy here, it deals with that. Let me read only a few statements from Spirit of Prophecy. This, th there are a number of passages here. These are from last day events Thirty-six point three to thirty-seven point three. You know that last day events is a compilation, so it, these the actual original sources. Um, there's about four or five different original sources here, but I'm just going to read some passages. This is what Ellen White says. She says, "I saw the company present at the conference." This is written in 1856. So this is what Ellen White says in 1856. I saw the company present at the conference said the angel, some food for worms, so some people are going to die, some subjects of the last, of the, so some subjects of the seven last plagues, so the seven plagues, that some of these people are going to have the seven plagues, she lists three people, some die, some, have the, some are going to go through the seven plagues, and then she says, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. Then she talks about translation. Now we know that that didn't occur because everybody that was alive in 1856 is now dead and none of them will be translated. The very definition of translation is to go to heaven without ever seeing death. It's not, do it's not dealing with the special resurrection. This prophecy was never fulfilled. It's an unfulfilled prophecy. She says another statement. Because time is short, we should work with diligence and double energy. Sorry, this is written in 1872. This next one. Because time is short, she believes time was short, we should work with diligence and double energy. Our children may never enter college. She, she's saying the children who are alive there not, she's not saying they shouldn't enter college. She's saying because time is so short, um, the children won't live to get to college age. So if you're 12 and 13, 10, you're not going to be alive by the time you're 16, 17 because time is so short. An unfulfilled prophecy. It is really not wise to have children now. Time is short, the perils of the last days are upon us, and the little children will be largely swept off before this. 1876. She says the children that are alive in 1876, time is so short, they're not even going to grow up to adulthood. But all those children grew up, had children, and have died. Unfulfilled prophecy. In this, la in this age of the world, as the scenes of Earth's history are soon to close and we are about to enter upon the time of trouble such as never was, the fewer the marriages contracted, the better for all, both men and women. Written in 1885. She says the time of trouble is about to come upon the world. And, people sh and it's not wise to get married because time is so short. You'll notice that was written in 1885, only three short years before 1888. Again, you come to another event um, in our history, 1888 which, 1888, which has some bearing upon what's going on today, and we can pick out events from that history and apply them to the end of the world too. But they, she was expecting something to occur, I mean, in three four short years. It was God's will that his people should be, 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 be prepared and that he was soon to about to return. It didn't occur. Everybody that was alive in 1888 has now passed away and died. 
The hour will come, it is not far distant, and some of us who now believe will be alive upon the earth and shall see the prediction verified and hear the voice of the archangel and the trump of God echo from mountain and plain and sea to the utmost parts of the earth, written in 1888. Now she's not talking about the special resurrection there. She's talking about people who are alive there who are going to still be alive when Christ comes. That was written in 1888. She was expecting the Lord to return imminently. Unfulfilled prophecy. The whole history of 1888 is an unfulfilled prophecy. And the last one, the time of test is just upon us. That's the Sunday law. For the loud cry of the third angel has already begun in the revelation of the righteousness of Christ, <coughs> the sin-pardoning redeemer, written in 1892. So in 1892, she says that the loud cry of the third angel, and that's code word, uh, if you like, for the angel of Revelation 18, 1 to 3 and 4, to have come into history. So that's what she's talking about. specifically verses 1 to 3. That's the point she's trying to bring out here. That event occurred, but it didn't go far enough. And so that has become a historical legacy of unfulfilled prophecy. So in the same way here, while the language appears at first to talk about the second advent, we know that it wasn't. And the thing that people pick up on when they look at this, if we go to... We'll just pick it up, let's see which gospel we'll pick it up from. We'll pick it up from Matthew 24, verse 30. Matthew 24, verse 30. This is why people place this last portion of these prophecies, of these, of these uh, chapters, at the second advent. This is why they do that. Matthew 24, 30 says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And so it's that term here where they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds. Now when we read that, we tend to have this idea that it's talking about a phrase that's found in Revelation, in Revelation 1-7, where it says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And so what we do is we lock in this passage here from Matthew and they're found in Mark and Luke as well. 24.30, and we say that's, de that's dealing with the event found in Revelation 7 verse 1. They're both talking about Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. And so they say this is talking about the second advent. And so it would have been, if it, in God's order, if this had been fulfilled prophecy and Christ was, had returned. However, if we go to Daniel chapter 7, if you turn to Daniel chapter 7 verse 13, Another phrase is brought about that people miss. For Revelation 7.13, I'm not going to be dealing with Daniel, but this passage is talking about the investigative judgment, when the judgment opens. In the terminology of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14 it, and 13, it's the cleansing of the sanctuary. So Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven, 
and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. Originally, most people would have thought that Daniel 7.13 and Revelation 7.1 were the same event, but they are not the same event. Matthew 24.30 is dealing with this event here that occurred in 7.13 and that occurred in 1844. And Revelation 1 verse 7 is going to be post, we don't know when that post is, 2009. Separated by, you know, over 100 years. Because of the failure of God's people in not obeying his will and following through with it, this prophecy here, which should have been the return of Christ to this earth, has now become unfulfilled prophecy. And yet, it fulfilled all the scriptures it didn't fulfill Revelation 7 1, it revealed, it fulfilled, sorry, Daniel 7 13. So all the scriptures remain and have integrity. And we now, at the end of the world, are able to use this portion of the prophecy and for our own benefit to help us. So this has just been a very simple and brief overview. We've not looked at the waymarks individually and see how they occurred and what, what happened in those things. Um, but I hope it's given you an interest, if nothing else, to go back and look at, the, look at these uh, chapters, to go back and to see how the destruction of Jerusalem, how the Dark Ages, and how the history of the Millerites All of them equals what's going to happen at the end of the world. It's an interesting study. So having done that, in our next presentation, I want to go back into these passages and just pick up some phrases that are introduced here, which will help us to pick up the threads of the 2520 and continue with our study. But without an overview of this chapter, um, it would have been difficult to do that. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your continued goodness and mercy. Lord, we thank you that despite our failings of not committing ourselves and following through with our commitments, that we have failed you so many times. And yet, Lord, even when it's your will to finish this great controversy and to bring your children home, and we fail you, as our forefathers have done, Lord, you still have a way of turning around events so that your will and your word may continue to have integrity. And not only that, Father, that you still are desirous and want to save your people. Father, I pray that we each would have a, a willing heart to re-look at your word. We know that it's so hard, Father, to fight against our upbringing our cultivated tendencies, the education that we have received, mostly through custom and tradition, Father, of force education, to undo all of that and to begin to investigate your word individually. Lord, as we go away from this study and look at these passages found in the Gospels, may we begin to glean thoughts and ideas, Father, that individually we might be able to fill in the gaps for ourselves to see how close we are, where we are in the earth's history. We know the Sunday law is about to occur, Father, but we need more information. We need more help from you, Lord, with guidance of your Holy Spirit so that we might make the necessary preparation to be ready for that time. Father, bless us. Continue to strengthen us and guide us, we ask and pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.